welcome to this episode of the Skiff Meetings Podcast, the podcast for curious event professionals. In this episode titled, How to Make a Bad Conference Good, Skiff Meetings Executive Editor, Andrea Doyle, speaks with Skiff CEO, Rafat Ali, and Skiff's Head of Event Programming, Brian Quinn, discussing the current state of conferences. This episode was prompted by Rafat's recent LinkedIn post expressing his dismay about the quality of conferences. The discussion revolves around the importance of industry experts on stage versus TV personalities or celebrities. It covers the dreaded five or six person panel, the importance of networking and how content must always be a focus. I hope you enjoy listening to this conversation and I invite you to check out the other episodes of the Skip Meetings podcast with tips and insights from today's most influential event professionals. You can find all the episodes on our website or by subscribing through your favorite podcast service. Now for a word from our sponsors, PHL Life Sciences, a division of the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau. Host your convention or trade show in Philadelphia, one of America's leading life sciences hubs. PHL Life Sciences, the first and only CVB division of its kind, will connect you to the professionals at the forefront of your industry and to a culture you can only find in Philadelphia. A city known for its rich history that's forging a bright future, Philadelphia challenges the expected and defies convention. A world of discovery is waiting. Visit phllife.com to learn more. Hi there, I'm Andrea Doyle, Executive Editor of Skift Meetings, and I'm here with Ryan and Rafit from Skift. And a few weeks ago, Rafit posted on LinkedIn a piece about how conferences are failing their attendees and speakers and it created quite a furor on LinkedIn. So we wanted to talk about what the why the reaction was what it was and how conferences are failing attendees and why isn't content more of a focus. So Rafik, can you explain to us a bit about why you posted this? Yeah, thank you, Andrea. Uh, and I'm a, a, a huge admirer of Andrea and the team that focuses on uh, on the meetings industry. And if you haven't checked out uh, Skiff Meetings, you should definitely do it at meetings.skiff.com. And they're covering um, business events and the next reinvention and transformation and all the all the issues in the meetings and events industry. So, and and my post actually had nothing to do with uh, what their work is. It just so happens that we also owners of of conferences ourselves. And this is my second company. First company we used to do conferences as well. So I've been doing conferences for 20 years at this point. So we've seen everything. We obviously attend conferences ourselves. We speak at conferences. We attend trade shows. Every format of of business event we have been at and have seen it up close from sort of dual eyes, one, as organizers ourselves, and two, as somebody who, as a media company, we cover the industry itself. And so, and to be clear, my comment was specifically on the conferences as an editorial-led, so programming-led events versus the other other types of trade shows or other types of events that have no programming component to it. As you know, many of them don't. And so um, the, the there's been a lot of talk and coverage and progress in the events industry and SCIF meetings has covered it over the years on, on so the one, the festivalization of the events industry and two, ex- bringing in and the related part, which is bringing in experiential, um, um, experiential components to a conference because people, uh, conferences and events, because people that are attending are now expect a lot more out of these events, both in terms of experience as well as in terms of ROI of their time. Even if they're not, you know, actually invested in as a sponsor, they want an ROI on their time. And so a lot of progress has been made, um, which is how to create more more uh, experiential spaces, uh, how to, um, technology has come in and managing a lot of the process, registration and uh, check-in, et cetera, becoming it more seamless. All of that has happened in and gets adopted by industry in different ways. Where the the events industry is not a, it's not a monolith, but let's just continue on that path, uh, has not innovated generally speaking, is on stage programming. And the general consensus that you hear from everybody is that nobody goes to conferences for the um for the on stage, they go to conferences for 
uh, for networking. To which, anytime that happens in a consensus way, my first reaction is, okay, so um, why is that? Like, why can't we question the consensus? And us as a journalistic organization, this was true for my previous company, it's true for, for Skift even more so, is that for us, our, our conferences are a journalistic exercise. It is talking to people in the industry, um, not necessarily to get news out of them like newsy news, but to get insights out of them that you wouldn't hear anywhere else. And in a different format than even our stories, for instance, or podcasts like we're doing now. Um, and so that's what we've been focused on since year one when we launched uh, in 2014 the Skill Global Forum. And now that we've had 10 years of experience doing all types of events, including virtual events and, and COVID and, and since and, and, and SCIF meetings particularly does virtual events um, well. And so um, it was a frustration. This is, I'm giving you the preamble and now coming to the actual point of the, of the post. Frustration with a couple of events that I recently spoke at will be unnamed here that did a great job of logistics. So like, Rafa, you're landing this, like, th this is all automated. So um, so me getting texts or emails on, here's the time you have to be here. Here's the, the, here's the, here's the limo that's going to pick you up at the airport. And it's arriving now. Like, these are all real-time updates I'm getting. This is a, a particular conference that I'm giving an example of, but I'm, again, I'm not going to name it. They did everything right, except work with me on the presentation itself. Nobody gave Which is the most important. Which is the most, which is why I'm there which is why I'm taking out my time, which is why they're inviting me, which is why the audience is giving their time. Um, and so, and this is not an outlier. This, is, this happens more often than not. Like they're very particular about send the presentation, please send the presentation three weeks before. One, that never happens and shouldn't happen. And why should that be three weeks before? That's a whole different conversation. Maybe, Brian, you can elaborate on that part. Okay, like they, they'll hound you to like, oh, please get the presentation. It's late and they have to... And I send the presentation in silence. No hand-holding, no sense of who the audience is, no sense of what the stage will be, how should, like, what, what is the effect you are looking out, you, you're looking out of the speaker. So everything that you would assume should happen to make a quality experience doesn't happen except for the logistics. And at this particular conference, all of that was true, but also, like, they were so particular about timing. And then when I when I get there and I'm waiting there and like the conference is half an hour late. And so so just to so so that so no wonder that if you're not giving the speaker a good experience, why would the audience get a good experience if you're not getting the speaker a good experience? And so it was a it was a mix of these types of experiences that sort of came out in this post that resonated, the one that you wrote about. And that's what I think makes Skift Global Forum stand out and your and Skift's other conferences is that the focus is on the content on stage. But that comes with a lot of preparation. So, Brian, why don't you touch upon that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And it's so interesting because I think Rafit's post, okay, sure, it's a lot of like discontent or, or, or you know, frustration with conferences, but it's really just important reminders on how. Uh, you have to be a great editor and perhaps the journalism background we have is really about the thing we understand is the importance of editing. Um, and, and the, and we focus on the content. I don't know if people, you know, you could, you could imagine some events, um, feel like the content will just take care of itself, but that attention to detail, we just got off a call with our moderators. Um, many of them pros, but we remind them all really about the fundamentals for leading a conversation in this uh, high-level, provocative way, and the preparation, the amount of rehearsal that takes. Um, and so, when you look at Rafa's post, because it's it's interesting, is if you're, we're yes, we can kind of complain that it's still like here we are, 2024, and yes, the events sort of took a hit, and we kind of forgot a lot of these things in the pandemic, and or we had a, a, a big focus on virtual events, but. Now we're fully back. I mean, events are, you know, we can't even book venues because there's so much compression. Um, and so 
it's amazing that we're still having to remind uh, our, ourselves or, or certain events or things we go to, and attendees are certainly more scrupulous about this. Am I going to go to an event and is it going to be worth my time? Because time is so much more important post-pandemic. That at the end of the day, you could get all of the lighting, the logistics, the, the design, all of that right. But if the conversation just sucks on stage, it's going to be the main thing, the the piece that people remember that just I was falling asleep. And so um, I, I don't know if it gets talked about enough. I think people understand events like TED that are incredible at delivering um, this content. And obviously they do a lot with it in post and, and the videos you know, are shared. But um, I think there are many ways you can invoke those tools, even for just a small gathering a small salon of 20 people, it's still these fundamental truths are there about what's the conversation, how how are we, of course, making the content as relevant and timely and, um, and exciting as possible. There's a mix of both education and entertainment that happens on stage. And so we listen to all these things. And, you know, the fun part about Skift events is that we never, um, we are constantly trying to hone and sharpen that. And there is never a sort of resting back on our laurels of saying, oh, it's fine. You know, we have to continually work at it. And so I think that's the one thing event, hopefully uh, event producers and, and programmers can, can, can take more, uh, you know, time to do. So. By the way, uh, you've noticed in the post, and I think Brian, you and I talked about this separately. Um, not once did I mention Skift events. Because it wasn't meant to be like a promo of like, oh, this is bad and what we do is good. It's implicit, I'm sure. Um, but I didn't necessarily talk. I talked about it from a speaker experience. Mm -hmm. And it's right. interesting. People talk a lot about attendee experience, but they don't talk about speaker experience, which is even less talked about. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for us, it's like you're getting all these big name speakers to give their time. If you give them a good time, not just not only will they be good on stage, it will probably bring benefits to my business long term to be mm -hmm. good, you know, to give them a good experience. They will come back. Um, so, um, so all of that. Going back to Ted, the thing maybe you know this, Brian, or maybe you know this, Andrea. I don't, I don't fully know this. The the conference, the main TED. This is not the TEDx part, but the main TED that happens. That fifth, what is it? Minute? How many minutes to, is the exact skip, uh, TED talk? I thought it's like 18, maybe 20, but yeah. Whatever minutes it is. There are 1,800 minutes of preparation behind that. That So Ted has an army of people that work with the presenter to, uh, to prepare them. So the end result is only whatever, 15, 18 minutes, whatever it is. It's the, it's the tens or hundreds of hours of preparation with each speaker that happens that has led to TED being this iconic and this format essentially being synonymous with TED. Not that a person speaking on stage was not a known thing. It happened, it's been happening since conferences has been happening in history. And, um, or, I mean, human existence, this is what kings used to do back in the days, like stand on stage and talk uh, or whatever the stage was back in those days. And so uh, it's not a new format. The other interesting thing that's happening is now TED is now, um, was it how many years it was? It was like a milestone number for TED, um, 25 years, something like that. I forget exactly what the milestone number for, for TED is. But they they just came out with Chris Chris Anderson, who now heads the, heads the organization along with with, uh, with our friend Monique. And so um, they are adding new formats in the next phase of TED, which has never happened before. So they're experiment, experimenting beyond the one person on stage giving this presentation to uh, adding Q and A. They, they, there was a podcast that, 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 that Chris and Monique did, I'm going to say a month ago, uh, that's on the Ted uh, YouTube page. And I'm sure the website too, on, on what new formats they're thinking about, because they think that this new world, I mean, he gave a more sort of um, exalted explanation uh, on uh, because that's how he talks uh, on these new formats and why it's the, it's the right time for these new formats. But for us, one of the Brian, you can talk about like how we think about formats and 
And I don't think we've, as you, as you said, we haven't gotten there fully because we keep thinking about new ways of doing this. It's hard to get past the interview because it's such a, the one-on-one interview, and I, I love that Ted's expanding into that. And I've seen, we've seen them do that. I know that uh, Elon Musk, when they had him for however long, that was a long conversation. It had to be an interview. Um, but I, I like that also as kind of a responsive, um, you, you know, maybe it's indicative of uh, quality of content, especially in our world now where AI is becoming, you know, mediocrity is very cheap. You can get lots of mediocrity through AI. And so I, I don't know if it's like, you know, are they, what's the reasoning? Are they running out of people that can give provocative solos? Probably not. But they also, probably most of it is they recognize the power of their ability to channel the conversation and those ideas. And this is what we do with Skift is, you know, even if we have a global CEO, it's not, there's, there's nothing left to chance with that where we really have to, you know, we think about even, yes, they have wonderful ideas, but our job is to shepherd that conversation, not just for the speaker, but for the audience. And we're taking that, the audience along for the ride, and we're making sure the speaker's ideas are best honed. Um, so I, I, I'm excited, all that to say, I'm excited to see where that format goes. With other creative formats, um, yeah, I think the fundamental, like, what what is... I guess this gets into like how conferences try to get kitschy or splashy or come up with these unique ideas. And you really have to uh, ask yourself. It's a fine, it's a fine yeah. line between being kitschy and, uh, and sort of stoking the ego of the organizer, which happens way more than you would, you would expect versus um, coming up with new formats. So we've experimented with debate formats on stage, obviously panels, and we have, Again, we can we can have the dreaded panel conversation, uh, which, is, uh, which is that, and I call it a manal, which is like six males sitting on a even worse. And it still happens in in many industries in 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 even in in our industry in the travel industry, um, even in meetings industries that in meeting conferences about the meetings industry it happens still. Mm. And not, I'm not just talking U.S. I'm talking on a global level. Uh, where they may not be that much, maybe there's some less awareness on why that's important. And so um, we shy away from panels. We do do panels, but they're they're sh- 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 short. I guess that's the word, meaning we don't have enough. Like if Max will have is like two people on a on a panel, moderated by by one of our editors. I know in India we had like three, but there's are three startups, and they were there for a reason. Three startups uh, together moderated by one of our journalists well it's all about intention i think the 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 conversation you're trying to to lead and the narrative you're you're putting out on stage having a really um well thought out intention of what each voice provides um the panel the, the 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 problem with panels is it's lazy for many in many applications you know you could say for, <laughs> for any global event like there could be many examples of just we have this critical mass of people and we brought them together because it looks good to have their faces on the website. You know, of of course, inclusivity sometimes or usually gets left by the wayside as well. Uh, Occasionally you'll get something that's a very diverse set of uh, group of people. Um, But then the moderator will get on and it's, it's very scattershot in terms of how they're directing questions. And the first speaker gets a question. The last one kind of just repeats what the first one says, and it's a nightmare. And so, this is where the choreography really comes together and what we really think about very proactively. We not only set expectations with those on stage, making sure that anyone sitting in a chair has well thought out their, um, uh, what they're going to say. Now, we never want a canned response. We don't send exact questions because not only because we're a journalistic organization, but because um, it's boring. If, if somebody gives their, like, their, their response that they've just practiced many times, um, Nobody wants to hear that. We want to hear kind of real, candid conversations. Um, but we do give them some topics to say, here's what to think about, and, and make your answers brief. Um, and then the coursing, it really, yeah, the moderator is the hot seat, and that's the coursing of that discussion. They should be the conductor. Um, I, I don't know if many organizations think about it in this very proactive way, set expectations, have a clear intention remind the audience where you are, provide them with signposts throughout saying like, okay, we discussed, uh, you know, uh, growth. Now we're going to move on to, you know, your core business or, or whatever, you know, some kind of other discussion. 
about that. We talked about this in the past when we talked about our conference of the story arc on the day, for instance. So the, we, yeah. every, there's a reason why we put this session after that session or this part of the day has this program. So talk about that part. Yeah, I think there's, in creating a well-rounded there's a few different kind of levels to zoom in. There's the macro entire view of the entire day of like, or several days of saying, you know, what are the big kind of questions we're answering? And probably when this has been most effective, um, our event in India seemed to really resonate well. We kind of had three core areas, more or less being uh, the domestic market, uh, the, the inbound market and the outbound. Um, and that really, it's so interesting, the power of threes. And I know it's kind of silly, but I do kind of, it's just, for me, it's something that I like with audiences because it's digestible and remember, you know, you can remember it um, and take them along for the ride. We never set, we, we rarely, so rarely set expectations with the audience and remind them where we are and give them that comfort of saying, okay, we're here in the discussion. Um, the morning, we're going to have some big high level CEO conversations and then get into more tactical, you know, the afternoon we have to be advised, of, you know, we can't, we can't get boring. People are just tired. And, and so if you start doing things that loses the audience, you have to be really aware of that. So there's a bit of variance that we build in and keeping the energy up. Um, all of these things have an intention. And yes, it is a little bit of instinct as you go through. And it's, it's always different. But there's, you know, that macro level of the entire day through the different sort of segments of, of blocks. There's different... Um, ways in which we could look at each individual, let's say an hour and a half chunk of conversation before we have a break or a lunch. And then obviously then the there's more granular levels of within each discussion. You know, how are we being of service to that larger narrative, taking the audience with us? And then the one thing we've experimented with but haven't always done is um, the ability for an MC to get on stage and level set and tell people where we are and we've we've both done it and not done it and um you know i think we we depending on the event the pros and cons of we learned that there are pros and cons of of having yeah. a, having an mc yeah I, if if i'm at the conference which i'm at most of the skip conferences i consider myself the host but that just mm -hmm. means i am the one welcoming you into my house type person not necessarily on stage it's this is true for all across the venue like i'm the one that I want to feel be I want to feel that I'm the one that are that is welcoming people into our home. And we really do like I really do think of our conferences as welcoming people into our home. And uh and that's why we think of everything, including like people walking in, what's gonna be the check-in, like every part of it. Which is also why this is the last point, and then um I'm sure Andrea have other questions, but um on stage, like sometimes people say, like people assume that we're going to have like a cage fight on stage. And why are you not trying to get into a cage fight on stage? This this sounds counterintuitive to people as a journalistic organization. One of the things I do want to say is that if we're inviting people into our home, we don't want, we don't want to piss in their ear. Like there's a this is a translation of a of a of a Hindi um, saying from from India of like. You invited me to your house, and now you're pissing into my uh, ear. Like we don't want that to happen. So, um, point being that you want insights out of people. You don't want them to be. You you don't want to make them look bad. At the end of the day, um, and so we'll ask the tough questions, but we'll ask it in a, in a respectful way, and we'll have a respectful back and forth, and also take the feedback that they're giving us, and then build on it versus like an adversarial relationship right so just so that they don't nobody assumes that we're having an agenda which is why when so, sometimes the audience comes to say like, you didn't ask hard enough questions and i said like look we try sometimes we're able to sometimes we're not able to and then sometimes to uh like it's not a cage fight like in india they really want you to because they're so influenced by how acrimonious the t the tv culture is there like the whole tv news culture there is um, this is an, uh, this is a whole different tangent, but a whole like it also depends on audience expectations um, and on what they're expecting. In US, more than not, they're actually expecting insights uh, and that they can take away and help build their business. Um, and so, yeah. 
And that's what we hear from many people in the meetings industry, how important it is to get the expectations of the audience and take that and plan from there instead of creating an event that you think the audience is going to want. And something else you said really struck a chord with me, um, how you've tested having an MC and how you're truly the host. But so many conferences get celebrities or retired news anchors to get up on stage and they are the MC and they are the host. And most often it's a miss. And study after study shows that attendees want to hear from industry experts, not motivational speakers or celebrities. Are you ready to celebrate your successes in the world of meetings and events? The Skift Meetings Awards are back for 2024, recognizing the most innovative business events companies across 15 categories, and we want you to be a part of it. Winners will feature on Skift Meetings, sending a clear signal to events professionals around the world that these are partners they can rely on. The final deadline for submissions is June 11th. We encourage you to start your submission today to secure the best entry rates. For more information and to start your submission, head to live.skift.com. Well, unless it's a conference about motivational speakers and celebrities, like that's a different, like if it's just a conference on them, right, right. Sure. I mean, this is also one of my pet peeves that I, which I mentioned in the article and, and Brian and I have talked about it for years is that not that I think being paid for speaking and we get paid for speaking at commercial conferences. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that part. It's that, um, you know, I don't get paid to speak at a dental conference. Uh, cause like, why would they? care um so like um you know an unnamed conference got kevin spacey before he the scandal came out uh, about him and in the travel industry and like literally he sat on stage and said like why am i here again and so and and which has and like people people and they said like why and obviously the the former presidents etc they get a lot of money on a speaking circuit etc um and so so they're two related but somewhat different issues. One is the moderators that industry conferences are obsessed with. This is particularly true in international conferences um, in travel industry of like either existing BBC or CNN anchors or or retired ones. And there's a whole career of retired anchors uh, moderating conferences. This is true for all across the world, by the way. It happens. I know this in India too, just because uh, I know the, the country well. And where former TV news readers, they, they call them news readers, not anchors, like they call here anchors, they're called news readers, which is really what they are. And so uh, of, of them emceeing conferences in the evening or social events, et cetera, they get paid, obviously, extra for that. Um, I think it has a space in different types of events, obviously, consumer events and, and um, award shows, uh, all the, you know, the, the ones we watch on TV, but also the ones that are not on TV. Um, in conferences, more often than not, they're a miss versus a hit. I'm not saying that they're they always miss the mark, but unless you're an industry journalist or an industry person who knows how to moderate, etc., it usually comes off as superficial. And this happens a lot more at association conferences. And Andrea, you may know this because you've attended so many of these. It happens a lot at association events versus media events like ours. And mm -hmm. and I think uh, some of it is to, I, I mean, you may know the reasons more than I do. Some of it is to uh, justify the members of the associations of like, look, we're bringing in all these people, giving us gravitas. So they, they assume it gives them gravity. Right. I also and see it as like a, I see it as a stopgap measure for not having, like if you're not a journalistic organization or not used to writing or or or, you know, having that kind of content creation in a very uh, thoughtful way, then it becomes the stopgap of saying, we have CNN, we have BBC, we have a journalist on here, and they're helping fill that, you know, that place within the event. It, it's it's almost as uh, not ill thought out, but it's it's kind of, it, it's the same thing as getting a paid speaker. Like it's, it's a little bit lazy in my opinion. Um, these are kind of these, these, some of these moderators just fly in, fly out. And it, yeah, it kind of creates, you think the conversation is going to be great because obviously they are interviewing people all day long and on, on television, but um, it can come off uh, somewhat flippant or just not, not very 
there's not much depth to it. But I, I don't know. That's my perception of when I see that. And it's okay. You accept it. But you just some organizations can't do it. But I would love to ask, like, can they think a little bit better about how to find somebody that has the relationships of the organization or just somebody that has a stronger point of view? Like, is that the only option? You know? Well, usually it's done to create excitement, help with social media. But study after study shows that's not what attendees want. Attendees want provoking, relevant topics that are going to help them do their business and help them. And they don't want to hear from these people. So definitely it's it's important to know your audience because, yeah, they can those those people could actually work great or or not, depending on your audience. But I think one one of the things I also want to say is that yes, the paid speakers, we criticize uh, that many times they miss, these celebrity speakers miss the mark. There is value in bringing in external, non-related industry speakers. Mm -hmm. But it, again, needs to be thought through of why we're bringing in, for instance, in the past, what we have done is to bring in speakers from the from the from the food and beverage sector so like restaurants etc because they're a related industry they are they, they're parallel to the travel industry in fact a lot of the business for the fnb industry happens in the in the travel industry so we've had uh, even before we used to have a restaurant vertical that we used to cover but even before we started that which, which lasted a while and then we shut it down because it didn't work but even before we started that we had danny meyer uh, and um, Rene Redzepe, who's famous as the, one of the most famous chefs in the world with Noma, we brought them in not so much to talk about tr- travel per se, but to talk about hospitality. And what is it to create experiences? Obviously, this is all very relevant to the travel industry. And nobody can say, like, we brought in a, a famous doctor. Like, what is that going to do to the travel industry? And so we brought in related speakers. We also bring in fashion fashion it was one year i forget what the ceo of of some famous fashion brand and retailers again these are all parallel industries to travel that have lessons none of them are paid speakers by the way um actually one of the chef was but 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 um chefs are used to getting paid to come to conferences so that's a whole different discussion but other than that these are all people that are coming to share knowledge of lessons they've learned in their industries that are applicable to this industry. So I think in this case, and you know, sometimes it doesn't work, but but most of the times if you do it well, it does work. But that's key. You're not afraid to take risks. And many conferences just do the same old, same old. And so many people were optimistic that that was going to change after the pandemic. But in many cases, they're just doing what they've done for years and years and years. So well, by bringing in different voices, it adds more perspective. I'm going to ask you this question, Andre, because you are the industry expert. You've been covering this industry for a long time. It's like absent a journalistic organization behind a conference or event like like we have. Who handles, like there's a term I think you used in your story maybe called experience design. And like, so who is in charge of experience design in a in the hierarchy of event professionals? And and like, where so, where do you think the state of that is today? So that's the problem. There's not enough people on staff that deal with stuff like that. Logistics become paramount, but then content falls way to the wayside. And that's an issue because then people aren't going to attend your conference year after year. And the other problem is there's not anyone on staff to focus on networking. And survey after survey shows people attend conferences. One of the number one reasons is to network and to meet other people in the audience that could help them on their career journey. But most, they just like put out a fruit and vegetable platter and have some wine and call that a networking event when it's not. So that's another area that's falling short, short content and networking. Yeah. We, we are fair to say we are on a, on still on our journey of how to get better at, at connecting people with each other. Uh, I don't think we are not there at all and i don't think we would pretend to say that we're the best networking events in the planet because we lean so heavily into the uh, to the to the programming part uh, i do think that technology has held but it also gives up in to brian's previous point it's a lazy solution as in like oh but in our app we have uh the matchmaking thing 
And right. uh, which, as you know, they say it's driven by AI, whatever. As you know, none of that is like really true. And these are pretty basic things. Um, in almost all cases that I've seen, one, building a community around an event takes time. It has mm-hmm. to be repeated again and again. There has to be concerted efforts over a long period of time. Our Global Forum, as an example, is now established on the circuit, and there's a whole ecosystem around it that we have no control over. And we don't want any control over, meaning you can't really, beyond a certain point, uh, expect to have full control over a community that you've created and, and be okay with that. Like it took a while to say, oh, these people are doing these side events that they're not paying us money to do it. Like, what do you mean? And then, and Brian and I have had these conversations of like, actually, let them do it. It's actually, it's, it's good. We have to let go as organizers as well on that front. Yeah, it's always a balance. I think of this often, the idea that often pops into my head is this idea of a permission asset. And we talked about TED earlier, 40 years of TED, whatever it is. They have an enormous permission asset with their audience, meaning they, the audience comes and, and they're, they could do anything, basically. They have permission to do anything they want with that audience. They can experiment. The, the, when you talked, Andrea, about the idea of fear or taking risks, I, I think a lot of people have not developed that community uh, basis yet, that sense of trust, really. And that goes back to, um, you know, I think Rafit's point about the, the treating people like they're a guest in your home. In, in a restaurant, in an event, in any of these circumstances, in an office, you welcome in for a meeting. This hospitality idea and, and removing the kind of impersonal and making it, you know, we, in a sense, it is a degree of personalization that peeping, making people feel seen who are at this event and that they are important and that they are learning things. This is what drives the affinity, the core memory, these huge, these things that, that then they go and tell other people about your event, which of course, word of mouth marketing is still a great thing. And so all these factors, I, I would say, you know, we, we have not, we do around networking is not, we don't use a lot of different devices and tools. And that's the thing we haven't really experimented with. But what we do get right is we have an incredible audience who knows each other and knows that they, and yes, they're, they kind of know what they want to get from each other. So we have not only great level, you know, great people in the room, they feel that sense of welcome. We try to, you know, what we could do more for sure is have more surprise and delight to bring them together or find ways to, to say, okay, you know, here's something that totally was an icebreaker that allows me to connect with other people, um, that I would not have otherwise connected with in a thousand person room. That's really important. And then also making sure that the, that events today rather than the top-down nature, you know, I just heard from Kevin Bacon on stage, what an exciting day, you know, the top-down, I don't know what that provides, you know, top-down nature event, that there's, there's very little, even though we focus a lot on like a CEO on stage, and there is, of course, a top-down nature to that, the, the real thing is people are always asking, what's this, what's in this for me? They want that participatory element, and I think, you know, there's a self-interest baked in, and it's on the, the onus is on the event organizer, to think about that and open up ways for those audience members to also, you know, feel like they were equally as important that they were there and, you know, the the connections they made. So anyway, all these things are, are what I think about networking, not just, um, not just that we had an hour with a mixer, with some, you know, a bar open. And it's about this larger issue that, that I think is the, the Holy grail we'd love to see. One of the things that and creating community is even more important than just networking. Yeah, yeah, and it takes time. I, I honestly, I think um, we've learned this that when people like we launch new conferences all the time, it gets harder year two, year three, because year one, a lot of people come to Skiff conferences for the novelty of it. So, like, oh, it's Skiff there. We know that they do great conferences, so they'll come. Year two and year three to build buzz and programming and community around it, it gets harder. So that means intentionality gets even more important in terms of how you then build from there. And it's easily a five to seven year arc uh, for many of these to become true communities. And New York has become for us, people come, it's a known thing. It's um, 
obviously we have to continue to realize that the format doesn't get tired. We continue to think about new things that's an art on us. And for, you know, honestly, we worry about it every day. Uh, it's like, how do we make sure that our conferences are relevant, particularly in an age where, and this is the elephant in the room that we haven't talked about yet, is in when virtual events are easily possible. We could easily just get a speaker on video and like how it would be different from getting, like, why should we come to your conferences? For some amount of people, that may be true. Like, they don't come to skip conferences anymore because they can just watch it online. I think that intangible, that intangible of the physical connection or the lure or something, that I, I hope that will still prevail. But you're right. Like, you could ask yourself, I could easily get this. You know, I know who's in the room. I don't really care. You know, I don't, I'm, the content's not that great. And so you have, what, what is that lure and, and uh, that hook that you have for your event um, that does and, create and that? And that's what com- conference organizers must keep in mind. Yeah, and that's why and, I mean, the cliche is like, unless you create an, I mean, the word experience is a cliche, but it's cliche for a reason. Like, unless you create an experience, and I think that the India event is such a great example because it, one, it just happened for us about a month and a half ago, or maybe even just a month ago, a month and a half ago. And, but it was also just such an experience for people. They came away, even though it's not like we did like quote unquote experiential things. We just did the show that we do, uh, but, but everything right. And for them, it was such a novelty for uh, a country like India there to see a conference like us, particularly the travel industry. I'm sure there are good conferences in the other industries in India. Just that travel industry hadn't seen this blend of, of things that we brought together, that it was an experience as a result of it, not because we were trying to create, quote unquote, experiential conference. Right. It was in a hotel. It was a conference in a hotel. This wasn't revolutionary. We weren't in a tent, you know, in some kind of sail tent like Cirque du Soleil yeah, out in the field. No, but the, 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 since I mentioned tangible before, the thing that made it successful, and, and again, none of this is us tooting our own horn. We are practitioners that think about this every day and, and question every day and continue to push, you know. But the thing that, in the end result, what led that to be memorable is that sense of warmth, that sense of hospitality, the sense of novelty that we knew we strike the right balance, even if it's just an event in a hotel. Of course, the catering, the hotel did an amazing job at the Leela with, you know, providing really thoughtful and, and beautiful things. Um, so anyway, you know, of course, we're always, we're pushing that boundary as high as we possibly can. Um, and events are, by nature, imperfect. And so we never know exactly how this is all going to come together. But through the group effort and the incredible team, you know, everything that we do, that we push the boundaries, that's what it takes. And, and I think that's hopefully the cautionary, you know, or the advice that we would give here to say, you know, how, how are any other events that we would attend or see globally, how are they also invoking these things that are free, that are just, you know, you, well, it takes time and energy, but it's just, it's all there for you. You just have to do it. I think the last thing I'll say, because we're running up on time now, is like nothing works itself out. Everything has to be thought through. You may not be able to think it through year one, or if you're just new to events, but over a period of time, the expectations of audiences and people who are attending uh, increase. And so you have to think through every part of the, of the experience. And so what we've been talking about for the last, uh, I guess, 40 minutes or so is that attend speaker experience by focusing on speaker experience, it can actually have an effect on all the other parts of the experience as well and and why that matters. And so if there's one takeaway from that, takeaway from this, that would be the, my takeaway that I want people to take away is that speaker experience matters and that and what is what is you know define the word experience and map up every every part of it and sort of and then make sure that somebody's responsible in your organization for making sure that that uh, that they're the they're where the buck stops, and so so then they're able to deliver on whatever expectations you have from them. So in our company, that's a big part of like somebody is, is responsible for every part of the experience. If nobody's even if you've thought it out and nobody's responsible, guarantee nine times out of ten it will, it will fall through. So we, 
in this, Brian knows this very well. Unless somebody's responsible, it will fall through. So have someone who focuses on speaker experience, the content the speaker is going to be presenting, and a little less on logistics. No, logistics are equally important. Um, it's the empathy of putting yourself in literally the speaker's shoes, the audience's shoes, all of these things, walking them through their day, their experience, what you're creating, and making sure all of those details align. And yes, having your team help all be on the same page to execute that. It's all equally important. We're not saying that logistics are not important. Um, yeah. Those are well, some of those. Talk are about the importance, like we've talked about the importance of conversation, and this has been a great conversation. If you want to leave the audience with one last takeaway, what would that be? Read skip meetings. This, this is what we covered. This is the podcast that right. you hear these insights on, the work that Andrea and Miguel and, and the team does on, on covering different parts of the industry thoughtfully. Uh, and, uh, and honestly, uh, like we give a shit about this. That's why it all comes across. And so that's the one takeaway. Like giving a shit is such a flippant line, but it basically defines everything. And I think just be thoughtful, try to be thoughtful in everything you do. If you sense the pattern and the pattern is, is, is just, you know, if it feels stale, just, just, there's so many opportunities to just continually make subtle twists in the work that we do. And again, you know, we're, we're really excited about hearing from other people as well about saying, you know, here's what they feel would be the most important thing. And then we continue to judge and work that into our editing for the future. So we're, you know, we're not the only people that do this. So it, it's, it's certainly exciting that, uh, we just want to see events be better overall. I think all, that's, that's certainly something all of us can agree on. And that's why I wrote a story about your LinkedIn post, Rafid. It was great that so many people offered their suggestions about how they focus on content, how they make their conferences better for the attendee. And that's what it's all about. So yeah. Yeah, we'd love to hear from our readers, and this has been great. I thank you both so much for your time.